Thanks, Sarah. And, um, and thanks to Myosh for your continued uh, commitment to bringing uh, just broad safety ideas, safety solutions, uh, safety opportunities to, um, you know, to real, <laughs> real practitioners in real organisations that need to solve real problems. So I think you're doing two a week at the moment. So it's a huge, a uh, lot of heavy lifting for the industry. So, so well done. Um, so look, I'm happy. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, and what we're going to talk about is the result of sort of three years of work by myself and the team at Forgeworks um, to develop a solution to hopefully help organisations improve the safety of work. Uh, so what, what I want to start with is sort of three questions that I've been asked since I started consulting about four years ago uh, after my career inside organisations. Uh, companies just want to know where we're at with safety. So there's usually a triggering event or series of events or an open question from, from management or a change in the organization. And, and someone will go, where are we at? Like, you know, wh where are we at right now? And then the, the second question that we normally get asked is, you know, what can we do to improve safety? Or, or more recently, which is really cool, what can we do to improve the safety of work? And, um, you know, that... <laughs> You know, as we can imagine, lots of lots of managers, lots of directors, lots of safety professionals, lots of frontline leaders and workers are asking themselves that question. You know, how how can we improve safety? And the third question that we get asked um, and increasingly asked is, how can we incorporate the latest evidence based safety science in our organisation? And we know there's a suite of theories uh, from HRO to or high reliability organisations to human and organisational performance and and sort of some other safety theories in between that have brought new ideas and, and some not so new ideas, some repackaged ideas. And then there's an increasing sort of um, evidence base or empirical research findings that sit around some of these ideas, not just in the safety domain, but in the um, psychology domain, in the management science domain, in the institutional uh, theory um, domain. So we get asked these questions and, and for a while, a lot of our, our work that we did with organizations was very qualitative. We'd go in with a blank piece of paper and we'd, uh, we'd get underneath the business and identify specific problems. And what we found that it was really hard to do that at the, with the level of response that, uh, that increasingly we got asked to. So about three years ago, I um, started having some discussions with some very close friends and, and colleagues, um, particularly Beth Lay and Jim Moranis. Um, both US based and this idea of how do we move an organization, for, how do we understand where an organization's at and what is the roadmap or the steps that you would take an organization through to adopt the, uh, some of these new view safety ideas because there must be a progression, it can't be a divide from, from one to the other, uh, there has to be a, a sequence of steps that, that, that you can take um, because organizations can't work with dichotomies, it's like throw out all your procedures and trust your workers to make the right decision or um, stop investigating incidents, start exploring um, normal work. Like these dichotomies and, 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 and binary options just don't work practically in organizations. So we wanted to create the bridge. So for a year, we sort of set about trying to, uh, trying to create that bridge. And then when COVID hit, we got a bit more time on our hands because most of you were tied up in, uh, in emergency and crisis response teams. So, about 14 months ago, we published the Forgeworks Blueprint for Creating the Safety of Work. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, but that led on to what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so the specific solution we're going to talk about is the, the Forgeworks map. Um, so what the map looks like is there's, there's, what we say is three capacities. So organizations need to be able to guide, enable and execute work. So guiding is, is setting the direction setting the objective, setting the high level boundaries around which we want work to take place within. And we'll talk a bit about, you'll see some of those, uh, those factors on the right hand side. The second capacity is the ability to enable the organization to achieve these expectations and directions uh, and risk tolerance around work. And the third is the ability to execute day in, day out. You know, what happened yesterday is no guarantee of uh, the safety of what's going to happen today. So we need to be able to re reliably execute our, our work um, day in, day out. So we've, we've identified 15 factors under these three broad capacities. These factors are, are those, those elements of organizations or elements of work that we know have a, have a direct contribution to how that work gets executed and therefore where the safety emerges as, emerges as a property of that work. 
And then we've identified three broad approaches to, to, to achieving safety under each of these capacities and factors. So I just want to talk about that for, for a moment because uh, we all know that safety culture um, was alluded to in the 1970s by people like Charles Perrault. Uh, and then in post Chernobyl in the late 80s, we, uh, we, one of the findings of, of the Chernobyl independent investigation was that there wasn't a culture of safety in the nuclear industry in, in um, those Eastern Bloc countries and specifically the Ukraine. So then we got safety culture emerge. And in 1988, Ron Westrom identified three cultural archetypes in relation to safety, what he titled pathological, bureaucratic and generative. And he described these in, in the late 80s. And this was all we knew at the time. And, and this wasn't a bad reflection of, of broad categories of approaches to safety. In fact, in the early 2000s, Patrick Hudson picked it up. He put an extra couple of layers in between those three, uh, the middle and the endpoints of that spectrum. And we ended up with path pathological, reactive, bureaucratic, proactive, and generative. And that's probably the most popular uh, cultural maturity model that we that we have in safety over the last two decades. And people will be familiar with the hearts and minds survey and diagnostic tools that go along with that. And there's an increasing suite. There's a number of other tools that we've had from DuPont to, um, to DECRA in, in the meantime. And all of these tools have served a purpose. And me being here today isn't to, um, isn't to criticize or pass comment on any of those existing cultural approaches, only to understand what uh, different different diagnostic approaches can and can't tell us about the safety of work in our organization. In 2009, David Boris published a paper titled The Fifth Age of Safety, The Adaptive Age. And he talked really broadly that we've passed through five large transitions in, in safety management over the last century. Uh, this was 2009. So we started with Taylorism in, in 1911 and sort of said we'd come from these, these phases of um, technology to behavior, to management systems, to culture and resilience. And he talked about these, these five phases in three broad ways, from compliance to culture to resilience. And this was following sort of a lot of work that had gone into resilience engineering from the early 2000s um, all the way through until 2009. Um, but this was before, and, and the, early, the early seeds of human organization performance were already uh, a decade old in the Department of Energy in the US and the Department of Defense. So from the early 2000s, we had there. Um, their white papers and their, their guidelines on human performance. So what we want to do and what we wanted to do at, at, at ForgeWorks is bring all of this together. So we brought all of this together, um, like I mentioned earlier in the blueprint, um, after I'm in Melbourne and, and after, you know, however many months of lockdown locked away, we thought we'd uh, provide something back to industry. And so we provided this, this blueprint. It's nearly 40 pages. It is uh, freely available. You can download it if you don't have it already. And what we do under these capacities and factors and approaches is sort of lay out what we call the ForgeWorks map. So how do you understand where your organization might be? And how do you think about uh, opportunities um, or ambition for you to make some, make some change about it? So this is what we, this is what we provided. And, um, um, and we know a number of organizations are using this today uh, with and without our help. Um, it's really pleasing for us to see organizations and safety teams pick this blueprint up, um, collect their own information inside their organization through whatever data sources and channels they've got, uh, use the map to identify what their improvement strategies are. And, and, you know, every couple of weeks, we'll get a company come to us and say, hey, look at our safety strategy. And there'll be snippets cut out of the blueprint. They'll be inserted in their strategy. They'll use the language and the, and the, and the text and um, and, and the detail that we provided. And that gives us a whole lot of joy um, because we, um, we're only a small organization and, and, it's, and, and companies who pay for internal safety teams, it's great to see those safety teams um, having, you know, being able to use our tools to, to take them forward. Um, notwithstanding, many, many organizations still reach out to us for help. And um, over the last year or so, we've, we've supported more than 20 organizations, I guess, now to, um, to understand where they're at and how to move forward. So this is the engine. What you're seeing here is the engine that powers the safety of work survey. So with one of the challenges with some of the existing diagnostic tools around whether it's safety climate, safety culture, or, um, or other things in your business, and we don't profess this to be a climate or a culture tool. We profess this as a tool to um, understand um, the capacity of the organization to safely manage the execution of work. Um, but what you see here is sort of 45 assessments really 
uh, where we've taken each of these 15 factors across the three approaches and defined uh, what that progression might look like for organizations that choose that they want to uh, change the way that they're approaching managing work in their organization. And for different organizations at different scales with different, different risk factors, uh, they may have um, an opportunity to enhance their, um, their, their chance of creating safety as an emergent property of their work. So we, we understand kind of these, these, where the organization's at in relation to each of these, these 15 factors and approaches. And if you understand in your organization, um, what I want to maybe say right now is we do ask people what they think. And some people say, well, that's not really that objective. That's very subjective, what people think. And, and the answer is yes, but the answer is so, the other answer is so what? Um, if we worry in the organization or if we concern ourselves in the organization for, about how people act and how they make decisions, then how they perceive reality is actually more important to us and more useful to us than what the actual reality is. If people perceive that it's very difficult to get the resources to improve safety in their work area, it really doesn't matter if, uh, if there's really big safety budgets that they don't know about. Um, because if they can't access that information, if they can't interpret and, um, and align with that information, then they can't make the decisions uh, consistent with that particular um, information. So in some ways, people's perception of the organization and their work uh, is the, one of the most important things that we can, we can understand. And the good thing is we can understand it probably more so than we can objectively understand the real world. So if we understand our people, we understand uh, how their, what their local rationality might look like, which means we understand how they might make decisions in different situations, which means we might be able to understand where safety can be broken in the execution of work. So we, we realized after we've been doing a number of these assessments with, with focus groups and interviews, we kind of realized that we, um, we needed to be able to scale. Um, we were doing projects increasingly that were involving more than 200 interviews and, and 20 plus focus groups. And, and, and we, we still felt like we wanted the opportunity to reach the whole organization, but surveys are, are really hard to get right. Um, a lot of them are not necessarily measuring what you want to measure. Um, and, and what we wanted to do was not just put another survey out there that, that, um, that, that didn't help. So we, we sort of partnered um, with the Safety Science Innovation Lab at Griffith, uh, where I'm an adjunct fellow uh, there. And we, we set about trying to develop a, a diagnostic tool in the form of a survey more than a year ago. Um, we, it took us about five iterations um, of di even different survey structures and different approaches. So if you take our survey, you'll realize we don't use a five point like it scale, like strongly disagree through to strongly agree um, because it's, um, our view is that it doesn't help. Uh, one of the big problems with that sort of approach is that you don't get a sense of the direction of what the person thinks. So if they say, um, if they say, if you ask the question, we appropriately hold people to account for safety uh, breaches and they say strongly, if they say disagree, you don't know whether they want you, whether they want the organization to hold people more to account or less to account. So even if you get the outcome, you're kind of still not sure about understanding what people think, which means some of those single question scales become very problematic for acting upon. Or we, we another question might be, we, um, we compromise on safety when production schedules are tight. And then you might go, well, if, 60% of people say agree. Um, is that good or is that bad? Or is, is you know, what's contributing to that? What do we need to do? Um, so what, what we've sort of thought through, and I've used a lot of those instruments over the last 20 years of my career, is that it can be very hard to actually know what to do and how to respond to the findings in the organization. So we set about challenging that. So the way we designed the survey wasn't to go about uh, using those sorts of scales. Um, we use a range of options at each end. The other thing that we do, which is kind of really cool, I think, which I don't think any other tool does as far as I'm aware, is we ask people directly the question about what it should be. Um, so what we kind of do is we say, what does your, what, what do you think should, whatever it is, leadership look like? And, and um, without going into the detail, it's a more specific question than that. And then we ask, what is it? What is your experience of it within your organization? 
Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, about that in the moment of what we what it does, but it kind of gives you as an organization 90 assessments. It gives you these 45 assessments in these 45 cells for what your organization is uh, in the minds of your people. And it also gives you 45 assessments of where your people think it should be. And I'll talk about the importance of that in the moment. When we, when we present the findings, we, we present it on this kind of a circumflex. It's a starburst diagram. Uh, it's kind of no ordinary diagram because like I said, it sort of hides a lot of drill down, um, what we say drill down gold. So in one of these cells, you can drill down into um, all, of the, all of the different responses and, and percentages and, um, and, uh, and you know, should be versus as is in your organization. So once we get that, um, that position, uh, here's one that we prepared earlier. So what we would do is we'd look at this and, and if you've looked at our blueprint, you'd be able to um, understand that here's, here's 15 factors. We've got the compliant ring in the middle in terms of an approach, the leading uh, ring in the middle, and then the resilient ring around the outside where there's currently, at least for this example, nothing, nothing shaded. So what we do if we were following the, uh, the Forgeworks map and we were looking at a, a position like this, we'd kind of say that, okay, senior leaders talk about safety as the number one priority. They don't do the bare minimum. They've, they're clearly trying to promote a, a zero injuries approach to the organization. However, you know, and they have a safety plan to support it, but, um, but they're still seeing treating safety as something that's um, fragmented from the core strategy and the core operations of the business. Um, in this organization, the risk management process is about compliance. People do risk assessments because they, they need to do them. They don't use the information from risk assessments for genuine proactive decision-making in the organization. The, uh, the safety organization focuses on safety work. So we see there the last of the, the teal colored boxes which says that the safety organization is largely um, administrative in its task and, and um, completing safety work activities. We then get into the gray and our first, uh, first factor there is operational management. And we're seeing there that, um, that operational uh, managers participate and lead relevant safety activities in their area. Uh, when a resource, when a, in the resource um, allocation area, uh, when a safety issue is, is raised, it's prioritized, it's fixed, we, we fix the known knowns so long as we feel like we can do it economically. Uh, the management systems, which is the, the gray box right down the bottom. Uh, well, in this case, it sort of says it's really administrative and compliance orientated. And what that normally means is that people will avoid the safety management systems uh, if they can possibly avoid them. When it comes to goal conflict here, we're, we're seeing that, um, that safety is prioritized over production when people raise issues, when people raise issues, sorry. And then the focus on, on learning and development or, or training is just is making sure that people have their, their VOCs and their minimum mandatory safety competencies. When we move into execution, uh, the organization sees the role of the frontline workers to follow safety rules. Um, there's two-way communication up and down the organization. You'll see there in the leading category, but it's not open. And, um, and, and we'd have concerns about the psychological safety in that organization to disagree, uh, particularly with, with hierarchy. Decisions are made by the most senior person in the room um, or in the decision-making process, not by deference to expertise. And you'll see there that language there around deference to expertise. And you might've noted it in the table I showed previously, we have incorporated all of the HRO theory, all of the HOP uh, human organizational performance theory, all of the ideas out of resilience engineering and safety too into, into this map. So you can, where it shows up in relation to the specific elements uh, where that particular capacity should be represented for an organization to be resilient. Uh, we've, we've mapped that in there. Um, excuse the pun. Contractors in this organization are told what to do by clients that know better. And uh, the organization thinks that it's safe when there's a low number of incidents. So that's the position of company X. And that's sort of how we can sort of create a narrative to understand how these different capacities are coming together to shape work. And, uh, and therefore shape um, or create or not create safety as an outcome of that work. So when we go into the details uh, of, of this position, you'll see um, this is just an example representation. We actually do it in a, in a much um, cleaner uh, user interface with, with, with real data, but we can see how strong these positions are. And this is why I sort of said there's 45 assessments and even in here, there's more because we've got seven different worker types so if anyone can do the maths of 45 multiplied by seven, potentially multiplied by five divisions in your organization. So even if it's 45 by seven by five or something, if you're a company with five divisions and 
seven worker types and 15 factors across three management approaches. Uh, we don't want you to drown in data, but we want you to have the insight so that we can pick apart with you uh, how you can improve and how you can change. And this is a really cool bit about how we do this because you can see these tipping points and also these consolidation points. You can see where you've got um, a really homogenous approach in your organization, which is where most people fall into the same bucket. But you can also see where there's differences of opinions, where people are sitting right on the boundaries. You can see where you've got pockets in your organization where you're already there. And if you can work out how to leverage that into the rest of your organization, you can make really good ground. You get to see the direction. So it's really clear in each question, like resource allocation. We show you on a scale of where people think there's minimum resources available for safety, all the way through to where people think that they've got excess capacity to face unforeseen situations that may emerge from work. So in all of these 15 factors, we can actually show you where people sit on the range and you know then because they've been asked and referenced the low point and the high point of the range. So they're actually making an adjusted decision uh, based on knowing both ends of the spectrum and what we're looking for. So that's the position, that's the details. And what can you conclude from this assessment? Here's an example here. Uh, this is what, what we can sort of present. We can kind of show you, we can explain it. We can pull quotes out of the open text parts of the survey. We can kind of talk through um, all, of, all of these insights with you in your organization and, and help you kind of, what we hope is that we want you to have the opportunity to move your organization towards resilience if that's what you choose to do. And what we feel is unique in, in this approach with, with this tool, uh, which we don't think, and, and happy to be corrected, we don't think any other tool an organization is able to do is practically paint for you um, that how that journey might look in your, in your organization. Okay, um, Ben's just asked a question about question set. How does a question set change for um, each level of the organization worker manager? Um, we, we do have the opportunity to do that when we run focus groups and interviews. You know, we can, we can, we can assess your, support you to assess your organization through interviews, through focus groups, through a survey or a comp, any combination of those. When we do interviews and focus groups, Ben, um, and good to hear from you, mate, we, we have different questions. When we run the survey, we, we run the same sets of questions because that allows us to understand where there's um, breakdowns in the organization by asking the same questions. So what does senior leadership think of itself? What does the workers think of senior leadership? What do senior leaders think of resource allocation? What do the work, workforce think of it? Where we can show these, these differences in, in, in alignment around the as is situation, as well as the should, should be situation, we find that to be more powerful to um, help the organization set strategy uh, rather than having different questions and different answers how do you kind of reconcile those? So that was one trade-off decision that we had to make Ben in the survey. And we adopted sort of the approach that most of these types of surveys do like, and most of the employee engagement surveys do, which is to have one question set and split them up by, by role type. Um, and we'll talk um, hopefully about that more, mate. So, um, so look, what, what I want to do now, this is the most exciting part of this presentation is kind of now, um, only took us 25 minutes. So apologies for that. Um, but what, we, what we've got now is the opportunity to have what we call capacity scores. Um, this is actually really, well, I mean, it's, I mean, I'm, of course I'm going to say it. So, um, but, but I genuinely think this is, this is cool. So more than a decade ago, um, human resources in, in organizations went away from turnover rates, which was, we want to go from 9% turnover this year down to 7% turnover this year in terms of people leaving the company. You know, that was the, the lagging indicator. And we went to employee engagement. I'm pretty sure most people on this call would have done an employee engagement survey at some point, uh, whatever it was. And the company gets a score out of zero to hundred, it might be 72. And the organization sets a target of going from 72 to 77 on that employee engagement score. And that's of the assumption that um, if we improve engagement, we you know, improve job satisfaction, we improve productivity, we reduce turnover. Um, very well-worn path inside your organization to go from a, a lagging indicator towards a, a scaled measure of an input to uh, what might be the lagging indicator. So if you're of the view as we are, that these, these factors are things that contribute to the safety of work in organization and the, the, the empirical research suggests that they do, uh, then by combining them into a capacity scores lets you 
replace Triffa tomorrow in your organization and run the safety of work survey once a year. You get a score out of 100. There's an algorithm that sits in behind this, um, which is, um, which is um, I suppose, the engine room. So it's the intellectual property because you get the question sets. Um, but, you know, obviously we wonder, we, we wait more about, say, for example, what operational managers experience in relation to senior leaders than what senior leaders think of themselves. And even what frontline workers think of senior leaders because they're often not ex exposed to them. You know, we, we worry, we um, wait more about what senior leaders and operational managers uh, think of the safety organisation than what the safety organisation thinks of themselves and the frontline workforce thinks. Um, things like communication, we wait towards the frontline workforce more than senior leaders. So we've got these sort of, we, we do factor loadings and we do role type loadings, uh, gives us a, an, an algorithm that lets us come up with a score that lets us uh, give you a, a capacity score, which we think is, um, is pretty much a, um, um, Gene, look, um, I'm not gonna continue the discussion with you. I apologize about statistical reliability. Um, because you, I suppose, have been active in all of these tools in, in, in questioning that. Um, we do have a peer review publications that's under peer review. We've partnered with Griffith University for more than two years. Um, happy to take that offline, um, but I'm not going to get drawn into a, to a p-value and a, and a 0. Um, you know, five percent internal reliability. What I can say is this is the fifth iteration of this survey. Um, we've significantly um, tested the reliability and the validity of, of what we're doing against uh, processes that have involved running the survey blind with blind consultants doing interviews as well as focus groups, comparatively comparing that data and running um, the statistical tests on that data uh, with independent researchers at the university. So um, that's all I'm gonna say on that for now. And um, any clients that wanna see more information or are genuinely considering the survey, um, we'll talk to them about the, the reliability and the validity and, and how it comes together. So there's the score. Um, if, you want to, if you want to go to your organization and say, well, we're not gonna use recordable injuries, we want something different, then here's a quantifiable uh, measure that um, you can use for that. So what we, what we also get here um, is the opportunity to, um, to create an ambition where crowdsourcing uh, the ambition for your organization. So what that means is those those 15 questions that we ask around the factors, we ask all of the different people who, who do the survey in your organization, we ask them what they think it should be. Um, and this is really important. So when we ask the question of what do senior leaders focus on, you know, making sure people follow the rules or making sure people have everything they need to, to do their work and people score it on a scale and they give it. We ask them what they, what, what they think senior leaders should focus on and we also ask them what they experience senior leaders currently focusing on. The power in that is what you'll see in this, um, this circumflex here, and, and this is one way of representing it, is you'll see the opportunity to, um, to understand what your people think good safety management, work management looks like. And why that becomes really important is if you're going to um, implement a strategy or if you're going to uh, initiate change, then you're going to know where your organization is going to support you with that change. And you're also going to know where your organization is going to resist that change. So this is, this is actually going to give you insight about low hanging fruit in your, in your organization. Um, so once we've got that, that idea of uh, where, the, where we're going to see change support, where we're going to see change resistance, it lets us actually design strategies, um, programs of work and, uh, and, and change initiatives that, that counter that support. If you want to micro experiment and pilot something in part of your business, you can just pick out the part of your organization where the people already believe that um, what you want to do is the way that it should be. Um, and then you can go about executing that, that pilot without, with knowing that you may not need to actually convince them that it's the right thing to do. So here it is. Um, like I said, we, we ask a question at the end of the, um, the one open text question at the end of the survey where you get the, um, the opportunity to say, what is one thing that your organization could do to improve um, you know, the safety of your workplace? And we deliberately ask for what the organization can do um, because we, nothing about this is, is, is passing the responsibility for safety management onto the workforce. This is all leaving the responsibility for safety management where 
where it should be, which is within management and the organization um, in terms of creating the systems that drive the behaviors um, in creating the safety of work as emergent property of that, the way that that work is managed. So we, we, we ask this open text question, we get it all, we get all of this feedback, and then we can link the, the specific request to improve safety back into uh, the 15 different factors. And once we know um, where all of those uh, opportunities lie, we can look at not only where we can provide the opportunities, typically it's, it's, it's three to five, but what we're looking for there is where's the biggest gap between what people think uh, it should be and what it currently is. What are the lowest or, or some of the, 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 the low, well, let's just call it lowest um, in terms of a compliance sense. What, where, where are we kind of some of the factors that um, are, are the handbrakes holding the organization back? And where are those factors for which we're getting the most sort of qualitative requests for improvement? And we can synthesize that information. We can say, look, when we combine it, here's your three lowest performing factors. Here's your three factors, which have got the biggest gap between what people think it should be and what it is. And here's sort of the three factors where there's the most improvement opportunities being sort of created for. Um, and, and then we can either support you or we can, um, um, or you can go forward and develop your own, your own strategy. What I might do is, is just, um, if anyone's got questions, chuck them in there. It looks like um, there's another question there from Gordon and Ben. So I might start answering questions. The only thing I was, I was gonna do after this was talk a little bit about the science um, and, and some of the challenges with what we've got at the moment with things, but I actually don't wanna turn this into a, um, into a, a contest between different diagnostic tools. Um, I don't think that's, that's helpful. Um, we like to think what we've got is okay, um, but you know there might be better things out there that suit your organization. So what I might do is just stop, stop sharing now and, um, and answer a few questions. So, um, Gordon, hello again, mate. It's, um, it's probably getting a bit cold for you in, in Canada at the moment. Um, look, uh, sorry, it wasn't a question, mate. I agree with you. Look, perception is reality for people. Um, if we believe that um, decision-making matters, so, so there's a couple of things if we believe. If we believe that um, you know, people make decisions which are uh, which about their, the way that they act in the organization and, and, and the principles of local rationality would say that people make conscious decisions about what they do in organizations. And then if we believe those, those decisions are shaped by, you know, how they perceive, um, you know, what's acceptable and not acceptable or expected of them in their organization, then, um, you know, these things matter the most and, and telling people to have, make different choices uh, and have different perceptions isn't, isn't really a great strategy. Uh, which is sort of why maybe some of the ways that organizations have implemented um, cultural programs and behavioral programs. And note there that I didn't say too much about the theory of safety culture or safety behavior. I specifically said the way organizations have adopted it has, um, has, has maybe tried to change the opinion without changing the, the things that are creating that um, institutional logic in the first place. Um, so I think it matters. I think it matters that we understand it. And I think it matters that we don't try and change it. We actually try to change the underlying systems that, uh, that drive behavior, which is, as we all know, one of the hot principles, um, systems drive behavior. Behavior is a symptom of, uh, of the system of work. It's not, it's not a cause of, of an incident. Um, so look, Ben, um, for each of the ratings, is there a predetermined narrative to explain the results? Look, um, if you go to the blueprint, uh, like I said, there's a page on each of the 15 factors. So a third of the page divide, um, um, describing each of the three approaches under that factor. So we have a starting point for a narrative, but what we, what we, um, what we do, what, what needs to happen is to nuance that. You know, it's very different if someone gets a hundred percent of people um, landing square, banging one approach, and if uh, people get thirty-four percent in one approach and thirty-three in another and thirty-three in another. I mean, they're two very different organisations, and those narratives need to be um, need to be adjusted accordingly. Uh, so we will we will look at specifically. Um, what that spread looks like, and um, it's usually not that hard to 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 draw in from the other the other narratives in the different approaches to understand what it looks like. And and you're you're in, as an experienced safety professional, Ben, you'd kind of know that you can, um, you know, if you're on the if you're a safety organ, let's take safety organisation. The first one is sort of um, safety work. The second one is um, sort of risk reduction behaviors. The third is proactive safety of work. 
um, as sort of those three descriptors. And so when we think about safety work, if there's 100% of people say that safety people do safety work, we pretty much would know what that looks like. Um, if 50% say safety work and 50% say proactive risk reduction, then we know that you know that safety team does a lot of administrative activity, but also um, dedicates you know a, a portion of time to uh, to understanding and, and and working on material risk reduction activities in the business. So in that case, we would um, we would contextualize and balance out that narrative um, for that organization based on where the results fell. Um, otherwise, you know, I mean, you can pop a score out of a of a machine, but you know, of a of an algorithm. But um, all of our all of our projects are consultant led, which means that um, there's a real person behind the engagement. So this, the the program setup, the support for communicating the survey into your organisation, um, the anal the the checking of the analysis of the results, the preparation of the um, presentation, and as well as the delivery of that presentation in terms of a a management workshop um, back into the business. Um, we feel that there's a lot of value tied up in the in the consultant-led approach, um, and and people want that. So, um, thanks, Ben, for the question. Um, I don't know what that means. I, I think we we anyone want to ask anything else? Anyone want to ask me anything about anything? Um, because I think Sarah, if I'm not mistaken, we've uh, we've finished twenty minutes early. Um, yes, that's fine. Um... Well, well, we'll wait a few seconds for any more questions that are all coming through the chat. Um, while we wait. Right, let's give everyone a minute or two and see if we, we get anything else. I can't possibly have explained it that well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, right, in there. any case. Um, um, there is the um, link to the the report the um which i'm trying to find so i can drop that in the uh okay yeah look um so so look how clinton thanks for the question um how long does a survey take to complete um our our time stamping of of, of surveys sort of typically ranges from about four to 12 minutes um with people that we think has done it continuously uh, basically, we do it off any any browser. So we typically we issue organisations get a link in a QR code, and if you um, if you if you um, if you've been through the pandemic as we all have, you uh, you appreciate how to use how to use um, the barcodes. So the QR code, sorry. So um, anyone can do it on any browser, any mobile phone. Um, but typically, four to twelve minutes. The average is sort of six or eight. If you think about it being 31 questions, um, 15 questions around should, 15 questions around is. Um, and so people who spend 20 seconds on each of those 30 questions, um, you know, you're up for um, 10 minutes. Um, most people move through a bit quicker than 20 seconds per question as you, as you go. Um, so there's a question about how big is a data set. Look, our data set from the survey isn't huge yet. And, and I'll be honest about that. Um, we've got half a dozen organizations through it. We've got a couple of thousand, um, or more than that now, um, you know, but less than 5,000 data points. It is not huge. Um, um, and so that's something that I'll, I'll admit to right now. We're increasing, we're onboarding about two customers a week at the moment into the survey, um, including some very large customers, like greater than 15,000, um, 20,000 employees. Um, we've got a number of organizations in the 8,000 to 10,000 range that are about to kick off. Um, we've got um, people doing the survey on, in 10 different countries um, or have done it in 10 different countries. We've got the survey available in 12 different languages. Um, we are hoping that, um, that we can show the value to, to industry and, um, and, and people want to use it and keep coming back and using it more. Um, and we've got a lot of ambition for uh, a couple of aspects of this survey. Um, one is in relation to what um, continuous and ongoing feedback looks like within your organization, not just on this tool, but, but a range of other ways of collecting feedback from your people. Um, and also the way that we, uh, we, we monitor improvement and, and build improvement opportunities off the back end in terms of forward, forward strategy. So there's lots gonna happen with this, with this tool in the next 12 months. Um, and you, know, you can sort of decide 
Um, Jeanette, I suppose you, you, you guys, everyone can decide when they want to jump on board. Um, so Ben talks about the safety futures training program, the tool and the elements. So Ben, there's a, in the advanced safety professional practice program, there's a level in there, one of the core levels called leading change. And that level's got four missions within it, change management, diagnosing opportunities, building strategy, and uh, evaluating improvement. And when we do that, what she's actually mission uh, 17, diagnosing opportunities, and mission 18, building strategy, we actually use the ForgeWorks map as a framework for people on that program to diagnose their organization. And then when they get to the next mission, they use the, the blueprint to, to and, and our strategy mapping process to, to build their strategy uh, during that program. So uh, Jeanette's asking what industries, um, lots of different, different industries at the moment, mining and mining service providers, oil and gas, uh, manufacturing, utilities, uh, service providers to, to the utility sector. Um, top of my head, um, trans, transportation, um, distribution and logistics um, on the spot, just um, yeah, energy and, and power generation. Um, if you get in touch, Jeanette, I'll give, I can give you a full list of, um, I can give you reference organizations. I can, I can take you through it. I can tell you what, what industries um, we've covered. Like I said, the survey itself, um, the survey itself is new. And I'll be the first to admit that it's new. We did the product launch less than a month ago, and I suppose Myash is um, really up to date with what's going on um, and has done it. But but like I said, it's it, it, it's early. But we have been we have been running diagnostic processes for more than a year now, using interviews and focus groups. We understand these these factors and capacities and how they play out in organisations very well. Uh, the result it, it is the result of three years of development. Um, it did take us twelve months from when we started thinking about a survey to release something. Um, publicly, we had a couple of design partners um, over the last six months that we we kept um, working with and um, and 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 working to get it right. And like I said, with um with the research institutions as well, um, may, it might not be perfect. No no survey tool is perfect, um, but the organisations that we're working with are at least giving us the feedback that um one is they're finding the insights valuable, and two is they're finding the insights consistent with their experience within the organization. So if we look at content validity, which is something like, is the survey measuring what we want it to measure? Um, that piece of feedback where companies goes, look, this is, this is really, really interesting and helpful and, and nuanced and we see it. And it isn't crazily surprising because people who work inside organizations and understand the logics of the organization, if they're surprised, at what we feedback, like really surprised at what we feedback, then um, then that means that we may not be, be be measuring or we may not be collecting the insights that they experience in the organization, which would be a big red flag. Um, so Gordon, um, have you presented this at any major conferences? I don't think so yet. We were due to present at a mining conference, which got canceled. Um, yeah, I'm not sure we have yet, mate, but I think, I mean, I could present it at Energy Safe Canada in, I don't know, when we're presenting. I think that's about two weeks away, mate, in the morning. So, um, yeah, not not yet. Um, hopefully it gets on the card. The conference scene's been a bit um, hit and miss for the last 18 months. So uh, not much as not, not much as, as happened. Um, and, and we didn't want to go, we didn't want to go too early with this. Um, we um, at ForgeWorks, our our mission if you like is improving the safety of work and i sort of have this um this test this 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 challenge for every everyone in the, in our organization about the work that they do and if they can't demonstrate to me that the project we're doing is improving the safety of work within the client organization we don't do it um, and we've walked away from a number of projects that have either been administrative in nature or um or to satisfy a governance um, question that wasn't actually intended to, to improve the safety of work in that organization. So we didn't want to go too early. Um, we didn't want to go too early on this, Gordon, because um, we didn't want to go out before we were confident what we had was able to support organizations to improve the safety of work. Um, so I'm glad, Gordon, you've got a lot of people signing up. Like, it's a real shame I'm, I'm it's a real shame that we weren't able to do this in person, but fingers crossed for next May, mate. If, if you manage to get that face-to-face, -face, um, I will be there. All right. 
Right. Well, I've included the link. It was a really long link. Apologies. Yeah, that's a HubSpot. Book. That's because of HubSpot. Yeah, <laughs> I know that. I even know. Right. I, I usually get rid of the end bit. <laughs> send a better link if it's helpful. Um, I've, yeah. I've got the short link. It's going to go out on the email later today. Um, but thank you, David. I've included a link to a vaccination webinar next Thursday with lawyer. Should be interesting. And um, yes, lots of good feedback there. So thanks, David. Thanks, everyone, for joining us again. I uh, hope you have a great rest of your week. And um, yeah, thanks, see you next week. Thanks. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.